what I mean by reliable is you need our society, look at, look at the lights right now. They're not flickering. Why? It's because we have a constant flow of power. So to have a modern society, you need constant flows of power. And with uh, fossil fuels, nuclear, and hydro, it's pretty easy to give yourself a constant flow of power. The problem with the sun and the wind is they don't give us constant flows of energy whatsoever. The sun is off about half the time. It's got clouds a lot of the rest of the time. The wind is up and down like crazy. So what this means is you need a way of compensating for that intermittency. And you're dealing with something that's already expensive. These are, this is why these prices are, are so high. So if people say, oh, we'll solve that, well, you need to understand the physical dynamics that are making it expensive. So you either need a big storage system so that you could add up all the energy over time and stick it in a giant battery. And there's nothing resembling that technology because it's very hard to store and very expensive to store large amounts of energy. Or the other thing, and the most common thing, is uh, to have a backup. Now, does anyone know what the most common form of backup is for solar and wind? So that means when the sun isn't <coughs> shining and the wind isn't blowing, what do you use to back it up? Gas. gas. There you go. Natural gas is the most common. But some sort of form of fossil fuel or nuclear. But gas, for various reasons, is the best. So you guys are you know, proud Texans, right? But one thing, you know, Texas is definitely one of the best states in the country economically. But one of the ways in which it's one of the worst states is in terms of its so-called investment in wind, quote unquote, power. Uh, so let's see. In, uh, there was a really interesting study done. So Perry and all these others built all these wind farms, saying, you know, we're going to give you this much uh, electricity. And the figure they always give you is not the amount of electricity you're actually going to get. It's the amount you could get if the wind was blowing 100% of the time, which has never happened in the history of the universe. Uh, so what they, the Electricity Reliability uh, Council of Texas did a study of, well, how much of our wind can we actually count on, and how much of it has to be delegated to natural gas plants? And what they found is, quote, this is a 2007 study, 8.7%, 8.7% of the installed wind capacity can be counted on as dependable capacity during the peak demand period for the next year. So basically what they're saying is the wind farms are window dressing. They're not really doing anything effective, and the fossil fuel plants are doing all the work. And you might think, well, isn't a little better than nothing? Well, no, it's not if you're spending a ton of money, and certainly if you're talking about replacing fossil fuels. But what happens is it, it's actually even worse than you think. And here's an analogy. You guys have been in stop and go traffic, right? I was in it while I was trying to get to this uh, building. Okay, what's your fuel efficiency during stop and go traffic? <laughs> Low. Okay, so running, if you've, got, if you've got wind and it's on and off and on and off and you have to back it up with a fossil fuel plant, that means the fossil fuel plant has to go up and down and up and down and up and down to, to compensate for the gaps. So the, that means the fossil fuel plant is doing the equivalent of stop and go traffic. So that means its efficiency is many times less than if it just ran at a constant rate as a normal fossil fuel plant. So certain people have done studies that show that CO2 emissions are actually greater when you have wind farms. And that doesn't even include the amount uh, generated by amount of oil that you need to build these uh, monstrous, you know, monstrous things. So the whole thing is we, we go from we've got an iPhone here, in effect. We've got the iPhone of energy, too. In practice, we've got this is, this is a, these are really backward forms of energy. I mean, these are radically, radically inferior. And yet, we're told that we need to ban our most practical sources of energy in favor of them with no evidence. So the conclusion I drew after making these observations is basically that we shouldn't think of green energy as really a source of energy, because it's not really about the solar or the wind. It's a policy. And it's a policy that would force us to use radically, radically inferior sources of energy. And if it was taken seriously, it would literally destroy our economy. I mean, there's never been an industrial country in history that has run dominantly on solar and wind because of the intermittency problem. And fortunately, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where that's attempted. But the closer we get, the more poverty we suffer. And certainly, the, close, the more we restrict uh, things like fossil fuels and nuclear and hydro, the more the poorest people in the world will suffer. So you're probably sensing I'm not a fan of the, the green energy movement at this point. But I'm going to give him a second shot. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. All right. So imagine, let's put it this way. 
let's just say that hypothetically, and I don't believe this, but let's say that climate change is so bad, is so catastrophic that we just we can't afford fossil fuels. As much as they contribute to our standard of living, we just can't do it. We need, you know, we need to get rid of them. Is that is it possible that's the motivation for this? Um, because what I observed is that even whether or not you believe in catastrophic climate change, and I, I definitely do not, um, I believe in minor uh, human-caused global warming, but not catastrophic, green energy policy would do massive environmental damage. So whether you believe in it or not, it would do massive environmental damage. And I think it's, it's helpful to go back to what, what green energy people support and what they oppose. So if you think that the world is essentially coming to an end if we don't stop emitting CO2, what would your attitude be toward the only two proven technologies that can generate cheap, uh, plentiful, reliable energy? You would, your attitude would have to be very favorable. And if there are any problems with those, you would be very forgiving of them because the alternative would be the end of the world. Now, what we see with the green energy types is a very, very strange reaction to these. So let's take hydroelectric power. Who's seen Avatar? Okay, so Avatar is, is not uh, very subtle in terms of warning us about things like fossil fuels and whatnot, right? Now, interestingly, though, you'd think, okay, James Cameron, there is a man who is concerned about CO2 emissions. What I found interesting, though, is what James Cameron did right after Avatar, which is he joined Greenpeace, another group that's supposedly anti-CO2 emissions, to shut down the third largest hydroelectric dam in the world in Brazil. So again, this is the cataclysmic problem of all time. This is an apocalypse, and they're shutting down the biggest dam. Now, I'm not saying I personally think that every dam is the greatest thing in the world, but I'm in favor of fossil fuels and nuclear. But, so if you're not in favor of those things, how is it that you're shutting down dams? And it's not just this dam. If you go to the Sierra Club website, uh, you'll notice that in their list of accomplishments, some of their biggest accomplishments are all the dams they've managed to shut down. So these are CO2-free, emissions-free sources of power. And the reasoning they give, I think, is really the key to understanding green energy. They don't talk about human beings too much. They talk about things like free-flowing rivers and the migration habits of the salmon. Now, if the world is at stake, if human civilization is at stake with this catastrophic climate change, are you really going to be concerned about free-flowing rivers? So it's just it's off. It's, it's way off. And then the nuclear is even more off, I think. Because hydro is a great technology, but the problem with, um, with hydroelectric power is that it does, it's not available everywhere. You need a certain concentration of water, so most, most places in the world can't be powered by hydro. But every single place in the world can theoretically be powered by nuclear power, because what nuclear power uses is um, uranium or thorium, which are very common elements in the Earth's crust. And the way in which they generate power can be replicated as much as you want. And we, we already know of thousands, thousands of years worth of, of potential supply. So why are, they, why are they against it? And looking at the scientific evidence, now you'll, you hear, oh, well, it's just it's too unsafe. Now, if you hear it's too unsafe, remember, it's supposedly comparing to an apocalypse from climate change. It emits no CO2. But then if we look at the safety statistics, it's odd because if you look at the modern civilized world, I'll, I'll talk about Chernobyl in a second, which was neither modern nor, nor civilized. But if you look at the modern civilized world and you compare nuclear power to every single other kind of power, including solar and wind, nuclear power has the lowest rate of death. And yet they, they're screaming constantly about how unsafe it is. And if you listen to the screaming, they don't refute any of the evidence of um, the explanations by physicists of why it's so safe. For example, one reason it's safe is because it's super, super concentrated, so you can put a lot of layers around it. So the, the amount of concentration of the energy in uh, nuclear power is actually a million times that of oil, which is the second most concentrated thing. So you can put a lot of layers to protect yourself. The only really real danger is that any of the energy uh, gets out. Another thing it has as a huge advantage is that it can't explode, contrary to what people believe. So a nuclear bomb can explode, but it's got 30 times the concentration uh, of a uh, nuclear power plant. So there are a lot of physical reasons. You can ask me more about this later. But the bottom line is all of the evidence is this is this, regardless of hysteria, this is the safest way. 
and yet the green movement is so hostile to it. And I, I invite you to look at their reasoning, and you'll see you'll start to see things like, well, it's not natural, and we shouldn't be you know we shouldn't be tampering with nature in this way. And they'll talk about nuclear waste as if the most evil thing in the world is to create nuclear waste. Well, nuclear waste is just use uranium with a certain level of energy in it. And in France and in other places, you can keep reusing that until the energy level gets lower. And it's relatively uh, benign. It's certainly not the most dangerous thing in the world. And yet, so their objection seems to be it's unnatural. We shouldn't be tampering with nature. And this, um, this also comes up with fossil fuel. So it doesn't, this, this concern with our environment doesn't really add up. Because if they're really concerned about climate change, they would embrace these technologies. And I think the same is true for fossil fuels. Uh, now, you might think, oh, well, aren't, aren't fossil fuels really bad for our environment? Well, historically, no. Uh, fossil fuels are amazing for our environment. If you look at the human environment 200, 250 years ago, if you look at the human environment in a place that doesn't use fossil fuels, it's wretched. It's not sanitary. It's not clean. Uh, nature doesn't give us a clean, healthy environment. There's germs all over the place. There's dung all over the place. Go to Africa. Go breathe in the smoke of an open fire. It is not, nature is not a clean place.